I think it's possible that wolves will come into Colorado on their own, but it's going to be really difficult for them to survive here. Why um, so? Well, because there's a lot of anti-wolf sentiment in, in Colorado. I mean, you know, ranchers, farmers, hunters who want more, you know, elk and deer and moose who they can kill rather than have wolves kill. So if wolves came in on their own, I'm not sure how different it would be than if they were reintroduced or introduced. I mean, you know, when you say reintroduced, I mean, they used to live here, but it was a long time ago. And so there's a lot of, there's just resistance to having wolves in Colorado by a lot of people. And a lot of people who want wolves in Colorado don't know the details. So some people say, well, you know, let's get wolves here and we'll worry about how they're protected once they're here, because that's the big hurdle. But I'm against that. Against so bringing, I'm against bringing wolves into Colorado without being, having, you know, quote, guarantee that they won't be killed. They would consist of having, you know, regulations or laws or some, you know, if wolves stayed on the endangered species list. And so there's regulations, but then you'd have to enforce them, which they never do. Mm. I mean, you know, I mean, they really don't. When they have situations where a wolf or another animal gets killed, it's, it's rare that the people get fined or jailed. I mean, they have to do something really heinous. Like there was a guy in Montana who used a trapped wolf as for target practice while the wolf was trapped. So he got some kind of sentence, but nothing really. They would have to have some strong, um, strong, um, I'm not sure, guide, guidelines maybe you'd want to call them. It's unlikely they're going to pass any laws you know, or any real regulations to protect the wolves. A dead wolf was found on I-70 near um, Idaho Springs, which is about, I don't know, 45 minutes or an hour outside of Denver. And the first report was that she'd been hit by a car, but she'd been shot and dumped there. Yeah, I mean, science can inform reintroducing wolves to Colorado as it did reintroducing wolves to Yellowstone. I did some work on that project, but, but science isn't going to save the animals, you know. I mean, if, if people listen to science, then they would not be shooting wolves who leave Yellowstone Park. For example, they wouldn't declare that we don't need any more wolves, that they have a sustainable number there because it can change overnight, you know, literally. So a lot of people say, show us the science. And when you show them the science, they say, oh, show us the science <laughs> because they don't pay any attention to it. And, and wildlife officials like from the Department of Interior, you know, for example, wildlife services, I mean, they make their living murdering animals. That's how they live. That's how they make their living. When wild animals are killed, they sometimes say they euthanize them or, or they, you know, we, we had to shoot them. But, but really, they're, they're killing innocent animals who have done nothing but be the animals who they are. And if it was a, and if the human, uh, if it was a human being or a sentient human being, a sentient being who was the target, it would be murder. Some people are changing, but they don't know a lot of the details. But Colorado is a very heterogeneous state. I mean, you come to the Front Range, you have all the universities, you know, you have a high income, um, high education level. And you go to the Southwest, for example, it's, it's not that the people there are stupid at all. It's just more that they make their living doing ranching and farming. And they look at you know, they look at wolves as potential revenue loss. And, I mean, I can understand why they're concerned on the one hand, but the damage wolves do is not even close to being in the ballpark of the damage for which they're blamed, if you will. Um, and, and there's a lot of negativity. People don't, it's like the Little Red Riding Hood story, they don't like wolves. We have cougars in the state too, mountain lion, puma, cougar. And they don't get that bad rap because they're here. But I, I'll bet you if there were no cougars here, then, and they wanted to bring them back, people would be really upset about it. So I think a path forward is really education. Um, being nice, never, never getting upset with people. You know, just pick your battles. And if you realize you're up against a brick wall, just say, thank you. We can agree to disagree and move on and not getting into arguments where anybody goes on the defense because the minute somebody goes on the defense, you might as well go home. So putting it out there, but not 
necessarily only relying on the science. Rely, you, showing sensitivity, I mean, I've talked to ranchers and farmers who have lost cows. I was in the field on the Red Wolf Project in North Carolina, and a guy came out and said that a cow had been killed by a red wolf. We knew, he, we knew the cow had not been. The guy just paid him, and we walked away, which was fine. Why not? You know, because if you piss these people off, you have no chance of um, getting them on your side. Um, but, you know, there's ample information out there in terms of the actual damage that predators do, say, to livestock. And I hate the word livestock, but people use it. I mean, it's, it's magnified beyond belief. But that's what the people believe, and that's what you deal with. You have to deal with people's beliefs and desensitivity, you know, being having cultural sensitivity. You travel to different countries when you go to different geographical regions in, within this state. Same in Montana, same in Wyoming. Um, although Wyoming is like a disaster area for animals, I studied coyotes there for years. Um, you just need to talk with people, and if they don't agree with you, say thank you, and move on. There's a strongly negative, you know. Fact, faction of people um, who just don't want wolves or any more predators. Um, to me, the antidote to that would be putting out the information about how wolves could benefit ecosystems, um, putting out you know, information of you know, returning Colorado to what was. I mean, one of the myths of all these reintroduction projects is that we're going to recreate an ecosystem. I mean, we're not. The ecosystems are dynamic entities. And when they put wolves out in Yellowstone, some people said we're, recreate, we, we're recreating the Yellowstone ecosystem that existed in the mid-1920s when the last wolf was taken. No, they're not. I mean, the ecosystem has evolved. In fact, one of the reasons that people say that wolves are beneficial is because there's been botanical effects and positive effects on um, other animals. So the ecosystem today with wolves doesn't come close to resembling what it was almost 100 years ago. So when people start talking about recreating and restoring ecosystems, you know, maybe it's a restoration by bringing back native animals, but they're not recreating anything. So my tact is to just try to explain to them that it would be nice to have wolves here who are native and that they don't do as much damage. That has not been successful, by the way, in Montana. Or, or Idaho or Wyoming, okay? And so that's where the facts, it's nice to have them, but the science is, is not gonna do it. I always say science isn't gonna save the, uh, science isn't gonna save the animals. What's gonna save the animals is having a good group of people out there putting out the good word, but really what's gonna save the animals is each individual changing. I wrote a book called Rewilding Our Hearts and it deals with people reconnecting in a personal, almost spiritual level with other nature. So put the numbers out there and doesn't really, it hasn't done anything. If, if it did, people like Doug Smith, Mike Phillips up in Montana and Wyoming, well, working in Yellowstone, would have, quote, won the battle because they're the ones who are always saying, no, the numbers, the scientific data don't support what you're doing here and people want to do it anyway. I was talking to some people about this, actually, in a long bike ride this morning because I told them I was going to talk to you. And, you know, these are very educated people, and they too. Sometimes they have to listen to me far too much. But, um, <laughs> but, but these are really educated people who like nature and like other animals. And some of them still say, yeah, it'd be nice to have wolves here, but they've got to be protected. You know, that's what they get back to the original question of how would you protect them? And you could have laws, you could have regulations. You know, there's something called the Federal Animal Welfare Act that doesn't protect anybody but the scientists, doesn't protect the animals. I mean, the Federal Animal Welfare Act says rats and mice are an animal. So, hello. So, really what you have to do is you've got to convince ranchers and farmers and the people who are against the reintroduction that the effects will not be as bad. They don't care about T tests and P values, they they don't, and 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 some people, you know, negatively say, 
well, they're not that smart. They're really smart. When I studied coyotes in Wyoming, these ranchers and farmers were as well read as any undergrad. Well, maybe that's not saying much, but um, no, I'm only kidding. <laughs> they were as well read as any grad student. I mean, really, because a lot of them have the whole winter where all they do is read. So it's not because they're stupid, it's because it's cultural. And that's what I tell people. It's like going from one country to another, going from one county in Colorado to another county in Colorado could be culture shock. I think that a lot of them are just against it on principle, on, on economic grounds. Um, I mean, I've talked to some of them and they put forth some really good environmental, ecological, biologically based arguments, you know, about, okay, now you're bringing wolves back in, you know, from one guy said to me, and it's a scenario I would thought about, he said, well, we have deer here. And sure, people shoot them and hunt them, but the only predators they right now have, say, are cougars. Now they're going to have wolves. So by bringing the wolves back, you're going to cause more pain and suffering for the deer. And they're not accustomed to wolves. You know, they have not, I mean, generations might have, in a sense, almost de-evolved anti-predatory strategies, for example. So they put forth some good arguments. Um, I usually just say, okay, we just agree to disagree. I mean, I do. There's no reason ever to get into an argument or a pissing match with anybody on anything, frankly. But, you know, it, there's just no reason to. Because the minute they go on the defense, you're done. And I don't, and I don't think any, anybody who wants wolves in Colorado has anything to defend. I don't think we should look at it as that sort of an argument. But um, when you get into that, you know, position. I, I just really do. I just say, I'm sorry. I, you know, I, I wish we could come together, but we can't. So we'll see, you know, cause, cause really a lot of these people don't want to cause harm. They, re they really don't. I mean, they're not nasty bastards. They just don't want wolves. On the other hand, some are, I mean, they are like some of the some of the brutal things that have happened to wolves up in uh, and, and coyotes in Wyoming and Montana. You know, intentionally causing as much pain as you can. They're the ex I mean, they're the radical exception. So I think going to kids and teachers, schools. So give talks. You know, talk it up, and then you know, say, "Oh, do you, do you live with a dog? Oh, yeah, I live with a dog. Well, how would you like if somebody trapped your dog?" snared your dog, poisoned your dog, 1080'd your dog. Oh, I'd hate it. They'd suffer. Well, what about a wolf? Some people will say, well, they, they don't care. But others sometimes will reflect on it. I, I gave a talk in Australia a couple of years ago called Would You Kill Your Dog for Fun? And the reason I called it that was because they kill kangaroos for fun. And so I, and, and, and a lot of these people, especially the ranchers in rural um, Australia, they have great dogs. And if you took, if you showed any hostility, hostility to their dog, they'd shoot you. But they don't think twice about going out and headlighting and spotlighting kangaroos and then killing them. So that's another way I do it is just bring it home and talk about companion animals and pets and just say, well, you know, you're really causing harm or you're killing a mother. And by killing a mother, you're killing her, her children, if you will, if if she has children. I mean, my major goals would be coexistence, peaceful coexistence, and harmony among all and all the fluffy stuff. But that's basically the message I will put out to youngsters and, you know, future generations. I'll, I'll talk to them about the need to live together peacefully, to peacefully disagree, if you will, because no one's going to agree with it, everything that, you know, it's, it's unlikely somebody's going to agree with everything that, you know, another person feels. Um, and also talk to them about this relationship between violence to non-human animals and violence to human animals. It's called the link. And so one good example is like New Zealand has this war on predators. They want to get rid of all predators by 2050. And I've been writing a lot against it. And one of the major things that 
I didn't realize that it would be so significant. It's, so school programs are teaching kids to basically torture and kill possums and other invasives. They're being sanctioned by teachers, parents, superintendents of schools. New Zealand also has, if not the highest, almost the highest levels of domestic violence in the world. It blows people's minds when they hear that. And if you've been there, I've been there, and you know, it's, it's a peaceful country and everybody's beautiful. It's a violent country and um, domestic violence directed almost, you know, unilaterally to, to women is horrific. So I wrote an article called Imprinting Kids on Violence and that how New Zealanders who are favoring this slaughter of the predators using 1080 and violent methods might be unknowingly, unwittingly promoting domestic violence down the pike. And it actually had a big effect. Indeed. Yeah, amongst people. I mean, in terms of the message they're putting out, because once again, down there, there are people who hate the invasive animals. They're destroying ecosystems. They're destroying this. And they use brutal methods. I mean, I won't even, and, and I've gotten some, I've, most of my, the emails I get, I mean, probably more than 95% are positive, but I've gotten some using swear words I've never heard. I actually, I actually look some up. So my policy is if people call me something like that, I mean, I might be in some instances, I'm not in this instance. And if they misspell my names, I don't write them back. You've got to have a filter. So the reason I went off on that tangent a bit is you need to find a hook. The hook grabbed, so to speak, four women in New Zealand who I don't know. And I've been in contact with them a lot because they never put that together. I mean, they, the domestic violence problem in New Zealand is widely known in New Zealand. But they never put that link. It's called the link. People have studied it. Probably Paul Waldau can tell you a lot more than I can about it. So it's not a one-to-one -one relationship, but what it is is when you see violence to non-humans, it's a fairly good predictor of some sort of subsequent violence to humans. So for example, in Colorado, there are deputies, police deputies, who are deputized to remove sp spouses, usually women and children, from a house where there's been domestic vi um, animal violence. That, you know, and people go, well, it's not a perfect correlation. Well, nothing's a perfect correlation. Maybe if you jumped off that building, you'd go down or roll down this hill. But that's, that's what I look for, something that will grab people. So these women who are getting involved, and one of the women I'm working with really closely has been putting that message out, just saying, hey, look, you know, you're teaching these kids to, po you're having them poison, gut, strangle, possums and other pests, that's not good for the future of humans. So another thing that I do in answer to your good question is, I sometimes bring it back to the humans. I don't want to. I mean, I'd like everybody to love animals because they love animals and they have intrinsic value and all that fluffy stuff. The fact of the matter is, I've made some progress having people change when I show it's beneficial to them. And people go, well, they're not really doing it with their heart. I don't really care. I mean, if they're nice to other animals, then I would like them to do it because they care about the other animals, but I don't really care. You know, once again, it's hard to get a rancher to see the positive when, you know, he or she is losing revenue. Um, but, but I think you're right. I think balancing, it, um, you know, both. So, but here's where future generations come in. Um, some of the dialogues I've had with people in New Zealand, and they're really motivated. Um, one was a philosopher who I had to say, you know, cool it, you don't have to go into Hume and Descartes and all that. But, um, but he, was, he was writing these emails to me, which were, in, they were impenetrable. And I kind of know some philosophy. So I just wrote him back and I said, what are you trying to say in one paragraph? One. And he wrote back, I want my son and my daughter to have the enjoyment of beautiful New Zealand fauna and flora. So that was it. And that's where he's motivated. So I said, well, would, is it worth killing and harming, um, you know, these beings? And he said, no, it's not. But if I needed to 
if I needed to be, if I needed to wait, what my kids will have versus the animals I'm coming down on the side of my kids. Well, fair enough. I mean, I just, it was, gr it was great, you know, he said, you and I disagree on that. And I said, yes, we do disagree on that. But I, but I like the fact that you're civil. And I like the fact that, you know, you're concerned about future generations. Um, so, so there was a good example where he hated the killing. And he actually was protesting it. But there was the example where he wants coexistence. He wants his kids to learn coexistence because he said, that he's just not going to be around all that long, and he hopes that they have a you know a long life and they'll be able to foster this um, coexistence. So the, I mean, the bottom line to me here um, is there's no one size fits all. You may have to change the argument if I talk to you or you or you or you or a rancher or a farmer or a philosopher or a business lady or a businessman. You, my, you, I always like thinking about things on a case-by-case -case basis, too. So we have different problems. I, I shouldn't say problems, but we do. But problems doesn't mean negative. We have a different situation in Colorado than there um, was in Wyoming and Montana and Idaho for getting wolves there. So when people start saying, well, look, they did this here, we're not there. I mean, you know, we need to deal with our state. So I think for, like, the rancher, you know, somebody who's worried about revenue loss, you might want to focus on both. You know, you might want to say, look, you know, they were here, they belong here, we got rid of them, we killed them off, we're going to bring them back, and we're going to do all we can to protect you. I always say that because when you start talking about protecting the wolves, you lose half of them. So we're going to protect your interests, you know, your livestock and, and your interests when the wolves come back. So it's, if that's a really good question, most of them don't really care about intrinsic value. It's just like, when I've talked, I've given talks like this in rural Colorado because I was much against the reintroduction of lynx because um, it was what we call this dump and prey thing. They dump them, they pray they're gonna live. The first four died of starvation within three weeks. And so I was, giving talks. I would never give a talk at night in rural Colorado because people, they, they, they didn't like me. But I went and talked to them and I would focus on both. But some of them would say, oh, you know, you academics, Jesus, what are you, this intrinsic inherent value crap? They come and they kill my animals. So I said, well, you know, they have a right to live too. No, they don't. They don't think they, they don't, you know, so fair enough. But then when you start focusing in on how you would work hard to protect them, some, sometimes you get the ear of people. I think it could change with time with education and getting to youngsters. I mean, that's where, that's a lot of my focus. I do a lot of work with Jane Goodall and her Roots to Truth programs, and I go to kids. So you can help to change generations by getting to the kids. And number one, educating them, say, on the biology of it, but really, once again, it's getting them to feel a personal, deep connection with these animals where they don't want to see them harmed.